It's my pleasure to open this special event organized by Tel Aviv University. I would like to welcome Tel Aviv University friends and supporters in, the, in Israel and worldwide, as well as Tel Aviv University and the Olanda and David Katz students, uh, Katz uh, faculty of the, of the arts, students and faculty members. I'm honored to introduce our guest, a cinema luminary who actually needs no introduction at all, Martin Scorsese, producer, screenwriter, an actor, but above, above all, one of the most highly acclaimed and influential directors yes. in the history of filmmaking. Thank you. So, <laughs> that's you. Uh, since the mid-1960s, uh, as you probably know, uh, Mr. Scorsese, uh, he has directed more than 60 short, uh, short feature and documentary films. He has amassed more awards and honors than uh, we have time to enumerate. Uh, a, an Oscar for Best Director, a Palm d'Or, three Emmys, three BAFTAs awards, a Grammy, Silver Lion, three Golden Globes awards, and I'm stopping here, but the list goes on and on. From his first movie, who, who, Who's that, that Knocking at My Door in 1967, to his latest film, The Irishman, in, 19, uh, in uh, 2019, Scorsese has explored and reflected upon Italian-American society and culture, urban life, Catholicism, guilt and redemption, and family life. As Scorsese himself said last year in the New York Times interview, his movies are about, and I quote, the process of life and, ex and existence. I think the issue of process is fundamental uh, to his work. Uh, in almost every movie, it takes us through a process of, of discovery that unveils layer after layer, layer of the complex, complex thing called life. So we are thrilled to have you, Mr. Scorsese, with us today, and I would like to thank you for that. And I would like to invite Professor Raz Youssef, head of the Steve T. School of Film and Television, to greet us, to greet the audience. Raz? Thank you, Iran. Uh, dear guests, students, faculty, and friends, and supporters of Tel Aviv University in Israel and uh, worldwide. As the head of the Steve Tisch School of Film and Television, it is an honor and a delight to welcome Mr. Scorsese to our online conversation. Uh, thanks to the generosity of Steve Tisch, we are now on the top of the film schools in the world. Our students and graduates films and television shows are not only leading the industry in Israel, but also enjoying global success, such as selection to recent Cannes Film Festival, the international television deals with HBO, Showtime, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and with the recent TV show, Tehran, also Apple TV. Those are very challenging times for us, for all of us, and the motion picture industry and higher education is certainly no exception. We know that it's time, it's a difficult time, and it, giving is much more difficult, but more significant and necessary. Thanks to recent donation to the school, we were able to support new projects in interactive and virtual new media. We spend much time online and in digital worlds nowadays that I cannot stress enough how important it is to see our students realizing their projects. To Steve Tisch and to all of our generous supporters, Toda Raba, thank you. It is a tremendous pleasure to welcome Mr. Strosis to the Steve Tisch School of Film and Television and Tel Aviv University online conversation. Mr. Scorsese, needless to say, is one of the true giants of the world of cinema, whose award-winning work has shaped our art and our world. He is the author behind masterpieces that we all know, sight and love, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, The King of Comedy, Cape Fear, The Age of Innocent, Casino, Hugo, The Wolf of Wall Street, and recently The Irishman, and many other works in film and television. But Mr. Scorsese is influential not only by presenting great work, but also by acknowledging the work of those who came before him, by devoting his time and resources to preservation and restoration, by producing other artist films, and by literally agreeing to be placed within other directors dreams by allowing us to uh, learn about his insight and to share his love of cinema, by teaching us that in art, rules are meant to be broken, but also need to be learned by inspiring us. Thank you very much, Mr. Scorsese, and thank you all. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's a <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I'm in my uh, my uh, uh, my room, basically. <laughs> I've been in this room since March 13th. It, I went out a couple of times, but um, I work out of this area, um, and it's really an honor. It's an honor. I've been wanting to get to talk to uh, the students here at uh, Tel Aviv University and School School of the Arts for a long time. I would love to get back to Tel Aviv. Last time I was there was 1983. Wow. 1983, okay. Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, everywhere. Um, um, an extraordinary time that we had there. So for me, it's uh, it's really special. And Steve and I, Steve Tish and I go back a long way to 1971, 72. <laughs> so um, this is really special. Um, and as I say, I wish I could be there. Thank you very much. And of course, you're welcome to join us here whenever, you know, Time allows, and you're more than welcome to to come and visit. We'll be honored to have you. Let me pass the mic, or you know, the virtual mic, to my colleague, my friend, uh, Dr. Dan Chayutin from the Steve Tisch School of Film and Television, who will converse with you, Mr. Scorsese. Dan, uh, okay. thank you, and, uh, thank you again for uh, the opportunity to have this conversation with you um, on behalf of Tel Aviv University, and specifically the Steve Tisch Film School, which uh, from the faculty and the students, uh, I want to say my deepest gratitude. Um, and thank you. Starting off, thank you. And starting off a little bit with, with film school in mind, um, I wanted to ask, uh, you were part of the first generation that actually went to film school uh, in the US outside of the studio system. And uh, for the benefit of our students uh, who are listening, how did that experience shape you? Uh, what charge did it leave in your career? Well, it, it's, uh, it was a major turning point in my life. I, you know, I, I grew up on um, the east side of uh, Lower East Side uh, in the Italian and uh, Jewish community down here. Um, uh, and pretty much uh, uh, it was, uh, in a sense, not only being young or 16 or 17, 18 years old, um, uh, being... Uh, uh, in a sense, uh, provincial in a way, and also young and naive and coming from a family of uh, hardworking people who uh, never had a book in the house. So I learned everything from uh, visuals, uh, whether films on television, films in theaters. And I was taken to, uh, to um, I was taken to the movies a lot because at three years old in 1946, I, I got asthma and I couldn't uh, go anywhere or do anything. Uh, I couldn't uh, specifically sports. I couldn't run or, uh, you know, get excited. Uh, my parents, was, they, they were working class people, didn't really understand the best they could. They would put me in a room. Uh, and the imagination really is, is what, what, uh, uh, what I had to rely on, along with that, that, with storytelling that I heard from my parents and from my grandparents and from pe some people around me, and um, cinema movies, all kinds of movies, um, and drawing, a lot of drawing pictures, really, little pictures, really. Um, the, the point being that uh, right around the time of uh, uh, coming from a very enclosed space, in a way, almost uh, uh, in a negative way, you could say coddled, but on the other hand, you got sick. You know, you couldn't even laugh because laughter sometimes would be, you know, you'd get uh, spasm, you know, and you can, you turn blue and your parents would go crazy. So, um, in any event, uh, uh, by the time I um, uh, decided to go to uh, Washington Square College at that time, which was NYU, uh, it was only, and I always tell the story, I went to Houston Street. I was between, I was on Elizabeth Street between Prince and Houston. The next block over on the right was the Bowery. The block after that was Second Avenue, you know? And um, basically I went to the corner of Houston and Elizabeth and made a left and walk six blocks and I was in another world. A whole world opened up to me, a world, the whole world, not just, we had heard of this place, America, <laughs> but that was more of a, you know, Eisenhower playing golf. We didn't quite, it, it was not a, a understanding of, uh, you know, we were in, my people came out of the, uh, the depression and uh, the way many others, and they were formed by that kind of thinking. And the late fifties, um, I mean, the early fifties became, um, Kind of a boom in a way, an economic boom, and things were getting better. Uh, they turned from republic from Democrat to Republican, 
you know. Um, but in any event, in any event, when I went to uh, that first day of, of um, uh, meetings at NYU uh, orientation, um, I saw that there was a program that dealt with was called uh, TMR, Television, Motion Pictures, and Radio, and Every teacher, every uh, the head of each department got up and spoke about their uh, classical studies, physics, etc. And then when this TMR person came up, a man named Haig Manugian, um, he came up and started speaking, and he spoke so fast and with such passion and intensity that I realized this is where I belong. Now, having said that, because I most of the information of the world was coming through images to me. Um, and also discovering foreign films, not American films, but foreign films, uh, uh, particularly having seen, and this is the biggest impact, I think, when I was five years old, on television, having seen the Italian neorealist films, uh, Open City, Paisan, Shoeshine, and uh, um, Bicycle Thieves, and uh, seeing the relationship of the people in the frame on the small 16-inch TV speaking Sicilian or Neapolitan, and the people in the room, my grandparents who didn't speak English, spoke Sicilian. They were the same people. And there was this country that had gone through war and uh, cinema became, I don't wanna say two things to me, but they can be both, you see. It can be Wizard of Oz and it can be Open City. Now, so, uh, you know, this is, this is an extraordinary thing. And also in the late 50s, New York was bubbling with, with incredible uh, cinematic activity. Um, primarily, you got to remember, the studio system was still in. It was on the way out, but it was still in. And you really never got to make, there's no such thing as making a feature film in New York. Stanley Kubrick did one, uh, Killer's Kiss, maybe another. Um, and uh, there were a few other people, um, um, Arthur Barron, who did uh, Blast of Silence. Uh, but at the same time, Shirley Clark was coming around and John Cassavetes, and this sort of thing was happening with the American avant-garde, the, the New York avant-garde film, um, which also included narrative film, which was, uh, which was um, exemplified by Shirley Clark's The Connection and The Cool World, but particularly by Cassavetes' Shadows. Shadows. And so um, uh, it made us feel that with the right equipment, particularly 16 millimeter at that time, we could make a picture. We didn't need a studio. We didn't need a Mitchell BNC camera. We didn't need big movie stars. We didn't need this. This was now a possibility, you see. Um, uh, particularly the short films that were being made and the avant-garde was very important. Stan Brackage, Ed Emsvilla, uh, Amos Vogel, Cinema 16 with, the, with the, you know, the Mikas brothers. I mean, this was, you may not be able to make films like that, but this was, this was like a, a universe that had opened. Um, that doesn't mean we didn't love the, the Hollywood films of the, of the past. In fact, they were, they were still a mainstay, but we could do something on our own. And so I, I having prior to that, been more aligned with, um, I thought, Catholicism. And, and I tried for one year in a preparatory seminary, which I was finally invited to leave, as they say. Uh, I realized, I, no, I realized halfway through, I said, this is really more than what yeah. I thought. <laughs> this is a commitment that maybe I, you know, well, what had happened too was that there was this young priest, uh, Father Francis Principe, who was 23 years old or so at our diocese when I was 11 to 18, that, those years. And uh, he was the one who brought the outside world to us. He was the one who said to us that you don't have to live like this. In, in ignorance in a way. You know, not that he was putting down the people around us, but there was a certain, uh, I think, uh, looking back at it now, uh, the immigrants who came over from Sicily, particularly my families, um, they basically needed work. And they, were, they made families and they needed food on the table. That's as far as they went. And uh, he said, no, no, there's another world out there. And he would give us books by Graham Greene or Dwight MacDonald, um, uh, which was a radical uh, uh, point of view, um, classical music, uh, and uh, particularly, he loved cinema, like Westerns, but we disagree mainly on most of the pictures. But still, he had a way of uh, working 
how one should live the right kind of life morally in streets that were really terrible. <laughs> mean. You know, really tough because the whole area was also seeped in, um, it's just the nature of it, seeped in a kind of organized crime. You know, um, and so I grew up within that. Uh, having said that, I realized that I couldn't, I, I wanted to be like him. I thought he was great. And you just can't go to, you know, you can't make a commitment of a vocation, so to speak. You can't make that uh, unless you are fully committed to that. And you can't go into a place like that and think you're going to do it um, and make a life that way. And almost in my own mind, step away from the world. In reality, he's in the world. He's working in the world. He's working in the streets. Um, he, he, the, motive, the, the, uh, the motivation for doing that can't be because I want to be like somebody else. You could take that as inspiration, but then you have to find where who you are, if you can, and how you could take that um, inspiration from that, that guide, so to speak, and um, project it out into the world through what you do. And so suddenly when I saw Higman Nugin get up there, it all, it all, it all clicked. And I, I had also seen so many films that would go to the strange theaters up in the up a Broadway and 97th Street and things like that and see Russian films, Yiddish films, uh, Jacob Ben-Ami and, uh, you know, uh, Edgar G. Omer. I mean, I, I saw the Dybbuk back in 1957, you know, yeah. so um, and also Greenfields and pictures like that, The Singing Blacksmith. These were things uh, a whole other world opened up. And also at the same time, um, I was seeing foreign films on television. I always tell the story about Pate Panchali, which is the Sajit Ray film. I saw it first on television and they would show it in, on, once a week they'd show a foreign film on a local station in New York, dubbed in English. And um, what I learned about it though, I was looking at it and I said, this is fascinating. I said, the thing about this is that the people in the movie are obviously the people I usually see in the background of the movies made about India by French directors or British directors or American directors. And this obviously is made by one of them, about them. And this was a whole world. Then suddenly all that French films, um, Japanese, all of this opened up. And at that time too, you have to remember, there weren't that, the amount of films that we have available now to see, it's um, infinite almost. At that time, um, basically Asia was Japan. Japanese films uh, from 1949 on, uh, uh, Europe, European films, basically, and British films, hardly anything else, uh, hardly anything else was available. So you could, you could find a way to do research in a way, you call it looking at films, I call it research or whatever, um, and, and, and opening these, these uh, different cinemas around the world and, uh, and exploring them and being inspired by them. And also, of course, um, uh, learning about, or at least, how should I say, curiosity about the rest of the world and knowing other cultures, knowing other religions, knowing other kinds of thinking. This was the key mind opening. So you add all this, and this guy gets up and speaks like that. <laughs> no. And I, start taking, I started taking regular courses at NYU. Um, and by the uh, third year, uh, middle of the third year, I made a first short film and that received uh, some awards. And uh, you have to understand, my parents didn't understand any of this. They thought uh, one night they were, we were living in uh, Elizabeth Street and uh, three and a half rooms we had. And uh, my brother had gotten married or whatever. And I heard them saying, I think he's crazy. I think he's crazy. You don't make. There's no such thing as making movies. Movies, we come out of the depression, you know, Warner Brothers, MGM, what is this? I think there's something wrong with them. But, <laughs> but, but we had that, we, it, it was a new world. And uh, the key to the whole experience at NYU at that time was the belief that Haig Mnuchin had, uh, I had to say in a few people, but particularly me, and how he made us think. And he was not, gentle about it, I must say. He was like a drill sergeant at times. He was very tough with us. Uh, but he knew I had something. And I didn't know how to express it yet. But the right uh, guide, 
can call a professor, a teacher, instructor, the right guy who sees something in a student, she or he, and say, you know, that's interesting. I hate all that other stuff, but what about that? Who are you? What are you trying to say? And how are you going to go about and say it? Look at all these tools you have. Well, I want to learn how to use this machine. Don't worry about the machine. Don't worry about that device. You got something to say? Do you have something to say? <laughs> well, you're only six, 10, 18 years old. But still, you might have something to say for an 18 year old. You know, how do you want to express that? Well, I want to do it in black and white and I want to do widescreen. Forget, forget that. How do you want to express it? <laughs> so this is the key and it's a long answer, but I think um, I, I know the students are out there and I, I want them to understand, you know, I came from a place where there was, you know, I had to learn how to read myself, really. Um, and uh, I found the way um, uh, um, through um, encouragement, but also belief. And once he believed in me, my parents, uh, not that they were against it, they were concerned, as they say. Um, they began to understand. They came over to the school. They started to hang out there. They wound up in the movies too because I needed extras, you know. So <laughs> my mother wound up in all my movies pretty much. My father, a few of them. But, um, uh, you know, it became um, very real, very real. Um, uh, does that help in terms of... Uh... Inspiring. <laughs> I wanted to ask also because kind of tying up... Uh the ends that you you spread out um when you get into fiction features and with that generation of quote unquote new hollywood um there's again a lot of reflection about film history and specifically genres hollywood genres and at yeah. the same time the desire to give a personal statement and those things seem antithetical but they're that, not and that, so that was you... the that was the big <laughs> As I say, I think what gave me the the uh, the spiritual support were the Italian films. Um, they just did. They were like universal in the Italian, French, German. It didn't matter. They were universal, uh, you know. And uh, they they still they still work, and they still have an emotional impact. But um, uh, the uh, you have to. There was one other element I forgot to mention. Thrown into all of that was the new wave. <gasps> The French New Wave, the Italian New Wave, the British New Wave. It was uh, in New York, Andy Warhol, everyone taking apart cinema and re, uh, reworking the language of cinema. How you tell a story. And, uh, you know, um, for, for us, uh, I, I would think that what happened in early 1971, whenever I went out to Los Angeles, and for me, it was... I was still based in the, 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 what I thought was the Hollywood film, you know, and I had found that um, through Truffaut and Godard and then in New York, uh, Andrew Saris, that uh, they overcompensated to a certain extent what they call the auteur cinema, where people worked in Hollywood under contract and uh, they can make a musical, they can make a Western and everything. And yet they had some kind of personal style. Um, so between that and Cassavetes uh, and Ilya Kazan, very importantly, Kazan's work, um, I was sort of torn. I was going back and forth. Can the two be brought together? You know, um, we were all trying that, really. De Palma and Schrader and, um, uh, oh, my, uh, Coppola. Coppola had, he, he did. He, I remember one night arguing, he was arguing with George Lucas and me. No, with me mainly. Because Lucas, uh, he's got, he, he deals with the, the foundations of mythology and, and uh, um, the, hero. Uh, the hero and that sort of thing. I wanted to go the other way. I don't see any heroes. I mean, you know, yes, I like heroes. I like Shane, for example. You know, um, I had, uh, for me, I wanted to go the other way and I wanted to change the rules of the genre. And Francis kept yelling at me. He said, you can't do that. If you're going to do a genre, you have to go by the rules. <laughs> like, it was our mentor, so to speak. It was in San Francisco, and it was like before I even made uh, my first uh, film for Roger Corman. I was just shaping up Mean Streets, really. Um, uh, and so I understand what he meant, but for me, I still had the feeling that um, 
there might be a way to take a genre and still express yourself, uh, your personal, your personal, um, your personal beliefs and your personal style. Uh, and uh, did I lose everybody? Are you still there? I think we're all here. Okay. okay, there you are again. Sorry, but but um, uh, we found ourselves out in Los Angeles, uh, myself and Brian De Palma specifically, and admiring and loving the films of the of the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and uh, in a way, it was an interesting situation because you the older filmmakers were were finishing, you know, and many of them resented us. They resented said very often we'd hear them say, and actually some of them were. Even as, even if they were encouraging, they still had a resentment towards us because they said, you know, we didn't have to go to film school to learn how to make a film. I said, I know that. It's just that we're dead. <laughs> we don't, we know, we, you actually invented the language. I know that we're just on this, you know, we're coming in, it's a whole new thing. But, but ultimately um, for me, uh, within a genre, um, it seems to me that somehow and i've tried i've tried to uh interweave uh let me put it this way it's always a personal approach yeah. often the tension is will the personal you know overwhelm the rules yeah. and that's the tension that's back and forth back and forth back and forth uh in that film i did main streets uh, there is a lineage of what you might want to call uh, a street film or a film noir in a way, but it's not really at all. Mm -hmm. It's not, but that lineage is there. Uh, there's uh, references to it in the movie. There's a clip of the big heat for its line film. There's, uh, uh, there, there, you know, basically uh, when I was growing up in, in the tenements downtown, um, one of my, weakest areas I feel is a uh, lighting and camera because when I was growing up it was just either it was daylight or night we're buildings we're <laughs> brick buildings there were hallways there was a light bulb um, so for me it was either dark outside or it was bright outside so um, what I'm getting at is that the images I grew up in were film more they really were. We didn't know the word noir at the time. Those are the movies I saw. Also, my father would take me to see them. Uh, they were just the movies that were playing. But those images um, of the streets and uh, uh, the hallways, the hallways are very important. Um, yeah. The small apartments, the gloss on the, the paint in those apartments, uh, the windows overlooking a shaftway. That's just what I know. And they happen to be images that... that um, that applied to, uh, that you find a great deal in film noir. But um, eh, that's not necessarily saying that it's the same philosophy, the sense of fate and despair, you know. Mm -hmm. some, but I did, I did feel watching those films, don't forget it, when I saw them, I was nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. There was something about post-war America and something about the, uh, the uh, weight on those characters' shoulders, particularly the men, that what had they gone through? Some yeah. went through the war. They talked about it very briefly. Some didn't. But there was this sense of um, <clears throat> fate and a sense of uh, despair. And, and, and then, then add to that, and I grew up very, very, uh, uh, very, very cognizant of the atomic threat in 1950 to 54. You know, the air raids, the air raid drills, all of that sort of thing. So we as young people expected to be eliminated any second and those movies reflected that hence, yeah hence the tension with you know faith and the church and this sort of thing but but um in any event uh i then felt i had a connection to those genres that's why i had bernard herman do the music for taxi driver and i just looked at a, a film last night i showed to my wife on dangerous ground Directed by Nick Ray, Robert Ryan, Ida Lupino. Excellent film. Beautiful score by Bernard Herrmann. Mm -hmm. Beautiful score. Mm -hmm. Very strange film. Because um, it takes the noir at the beginning and then it twists it. So everything is dark, dark and dangerous and violent. And then it twists and everything is snow and white. 
the whole second half of the picture is out in, in a, a landscape of snow. Very strange. And then the, the, the woman, uh, the, the lead of the picture, uh, Ida Lupino, is blind. Uh, it's a very odd, uh, but I understood his violence. I understood Ryan's violence. I understood like, like uh, Schrader's character of Travis Bickle, the sense of yeah. wanting to clean up the world. And if it's not going to be cleaned up, he's going to destroy it. You see, and I saw that growing up. I just did, you know, um, mm -hmm. and I saw that despair in different ways, different yeah. ways. Um, and and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I have another note about it. Let me just ask you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing was somehow to to uh, uh, channel the, the personal always mm -hmm. through the rules of the genre, if you can do that. Even when it comes down to the shot you're laying out, what does that shot mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, the key. Really. Yeah. And then what, before I pass the baton to Yona, who also has a few questions, I want to ask about, I mean, throughout your cinema, um, I feel like it covers a lot, a wide array of themes, but ultimately it seems to be very much invested in, in the construction of a social world, the milieu, a world of ritualized codes, whether that be the mafia world or early 20th century high society in New York. And what is this investment in, in ritual? And is it because cinema in a way or cinema going is so ritualistic in a sense? It is. I mean, I go back to rituals of the family, dinner table, the breaking of bread at the table. Often they would, uh, they would do a sign of the cross on the bread and break it, you know. Um, the, uh, the, the beauty of family at table, also the battlefield. You know? And so uh, this for me was the essential of the ritual. Um, the, uh, I always think I'd love to do a movie where it starts, where the, there's all these people in a room and they're all quiet. And they're looking down and the camera's panning from one to the other and another. And you pull out and you see there's 15 people just standing there. And then you hear the sound man say, okay, room tone finished. <laughs> it's ritual. Yeah. It's, it's a benediction of some kind, you see. And so for me, rituals are like, um, I need them. I want them. For a while, I thought when I did Last Temptation of Christ, rituals, forget it. We don't need it. And uh, 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 an Episcopal um, uh, Archbishop told me, no, no, they're important. They're important. <laughs> and I realized, hmm, shut your mouth. <laughs> Learn a little more. But it was a phase I was going through. But the thing about the uh, ritual is that somehow a ritual um, creates uh, a, uh, a kind of a, an arena in which the struggles of life are dealt with and worked out. It just is. Even a ritual of a marriage. A marriage, dinner, children, whatever, bedtime. In Raging Bull, the bedroom is worse than the fighting ring. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, is, it is simply another ritual in a way. And within that ritual, you work out the struggle of life. Hey, there are many people I've seen in some wonderful films and great, great, great books where there are none of that. These, these artists can go off and um, are not tied to any of that. I, I, I probably too, because I found when I was about eight, eight or nine years old, the rituals in the uh, Catholic Church downtown, um, uh, St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, uh, I found them comforting. Um, and I found, um, I found solace there in that that was the first Catholic cathedral in New York in 1812. I, I found a kind of, because the streets were tough and, uh, you know, the apartment, my family, uh, people, you know, the Sicilians, everybody arguing. And this place was, <laughs> this place, you can go in there. Okay, you had to be an altar boy or whatever. And I didn't do too well because I would always be late for the 730 mass. Mm -hmm. And so I got thrown out of it. But, you know, um, the priest was great. And, um, uh, in any event, the benedictions were great. There was something very special about those rituals. It held the community together. You know, I don't. I remember uh, Holy Thursday night. We would go and visit all the churches in the neighborhood, and going from here all the way over to the Ukrainian church on Seventh Avenue, 
Um, this was a, a special thing. So that time has changed, of course. But um, I found that within the ritual, it structured your life and it gave you guidance as to how to continue the struggle. <laughs> Um, I'm going, Yona is sitting in the wings and he has some questions that he collected from, from students as well. Um, Yona Rosenker is, uh, Yona Rosenker actually, very, uh, acclaimed young filmmaker and alumnus, yes. uh, of our school. Hi. And so I pass the mic for, to you, Yona. Yona. Hi, Mr. Scorsese, I'm super excited. Um, so I will just, uh, ask you. A few questions that uh, I received, I gathered from my fellow students here at uh -huh. the Tel Aviv University. And uh, the first one is, of course, um, in The Good Fellows, there's the Joe Pesci. Um, you think I'm funny, funny how? And then in Taxi Driver, you got the, are you talking to me? And both scenes are known to have been somewhat improvised. So my question is, because I, I want to ask you a bit about the craft. Um, so my question is, how prepared do you arrive on set? Is everything locked or how much freedom do you let the actors or even the director of photography have, um, you know, with yeah. some oh on set? I'm looking over here, I got all this stuff. Yeah, um, I, I found that, that when I was, um, when I was a kid and I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, uh, participate in sports or, or other games and that sort of thing. Um, I would draw little pictures and then ultimately uh, once I began to understand that you can put them on the edge uh, the edges of margin of a book and flip them and they move um, that was around 19 I was about eight years old or whatever I um, started to make my own movies and drawings little drawings uh, I didn't understand at the time it probably was storyboard what you would call a storyboard I would show them only to a couple of friends of mine and they would say I would say well see it moves from here to here from this frame to this frame, there's a movement. And they say, it's not moving, it's static. I said, no, no, there's movement. <laughs> Spiritually, there's movement in <laughs> it, you know? And so um, I've got to tell you that ultimately what happens is that I have to get back to that state of mind. I have to get back to that solitude. Um, very often uh, lock myself in a hotel for like 10, 12 days and just to sit with the script and design or go on location check out some shots, then go back. And and what I'm getting at is that when I did my first films, I was so impassioned, um, even I'd say up and maybe up until beyond Goodfellas, my God, Casino, Temptation of Christ, definitely, Silence, all of that stuff. I, I draw the pictures. And and I got when you go back to the original ones, the short films and Mean Streets particularly and Taxi Driver, um, uh, I found that not only can I see the film and feel the editing and feel the camera moves and who should, where the camera should be on when, who it should be on when, uh, who's in whose frame, each other's frame, are they singles, are they doubles? Um, I find that uh, uh, I feel I'm completely prepared when I get on set or when I get on location. That doesn't mean that we can't change it. But it does mean there are certain things I really want. You know, by the time we did Taxi Driver, I drew every picture at that point because the budget was low. The studio didn't want us to make the picture. And I met with this wonderful director of photography, Michael Chapman, whom I understand was, was there recently and sadly, really sadly, just, uh, just died. And uh, uh, Michael, um, I would give him the pictures and Michael loved those pictures. <laughs> at one point we had a storyboard artist come in and do one scene for us. And Michael rejected them. He said, no, yours are more expressive. Not that mine are great, but he liked the expression. There's a special pencil I use, which is uh, one of these ebony pencil here. It has a, has a strong feel. You can feel the camera. I've put it in arrow. I could feel it. And um, Michael felt that. And so often we would have 12 images, let's say, you know, um, uh, for a scene or 15 images and drawings and we were moving so fast and we had to be so careful that often we uh, uh, out of the 15 pictures we'd have 12 done and he'd hold up the other three and say okay these three we're going to get next week in one way or the other so it was almost as if we had uh, worked out the entire film on paper that led to the ability then 
to open up for improvisation. That's the key. Um, and the improvisations were done uh, usually, I must say, a week or two before shooting. And they were rewritten from the rehearsals. I would write up all, I would audio tape them or videotape, whatever, at that time, I don't forget at that time. But then I would take the, 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 uh, um, the improv and make a scene of it and then give it back to them. And they'd work on that again, I'd take it again and make a scene of it. In the case of Robert De Niro doing Are You Talking to Me, that was not at all possible. We were in the last three or four days of shooting. We were five days over on a picture that was scheduled for 40 days that the studio did not want to make. Um, they were very angry at us. People were pounding on doors. Oh, come on, hurry up. We've got to do this. And I go, okay, okay, okay. And uh, I, I had this image. I had this thing in my mind. I said, you know, if you're in front of the mirror, playing in front of the mirror with these guns and this ridiculous uh, slide in his arm and that sort of thing, I said, he's got to say something. And I remember Bob, we couldn't figure out what to say. And I think he called Paul Schrader because Paul only came on the set once for that film. The script was so perfect, we thought, you know, uh, but there was nothing in the script about that, that dialogue. And so I think he told Bob something, I forget complete. All I know is that I squeezed it in um, on Columbus Avenue and 88th Street in a condemned building. I squeezed it in, in between uh, a day in which we were shooting back to back. And it took about an hour and a half and people were getting crazy. And uh, somehow, I don't think Bob was, he just told me recently, a few months ago, you know, I was never aware that everybody was upset. <laughs> That's the other thing. Oh, take your time, Bob, don't worry about it. <laughs> Make him feel comfortable. Because I had seen him do things during the shoot of that, during Mean Streets, where I thought, well, I would never, and then I saw him do it. I said, no, that's good. Wow, this guy's interesting. Okay, if he's got an idea, he better not tell me, just do it. <laughs> Let me see it, you know? And so, I don't know, he started, I was sitting in, on the ground in front of him, below the mirror, and I was looking up, and I was saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. And he started to get into a kind of, uh, are you talking to me? You know, are you talking to me? And and we knew something clicked at that point. We did it an hour and a half. We got it out of there. And uh, that was something that uh, came out of pure necessity, you know. And, and, and uh, if we had more time, I don't think we would have been able to get that. We had no time. In the case of Joe Pesci, uh, with our You Think I'm Funny, Nick Pelleggi and I worked on that script, uh, Goodfellas. Uh, uh, I, again, that script was almost, in my mind, I had it, I had it already shot. And like, it's not because it's so great or whatever, but I had it in my head. I didn't want to make another film about the, the, the you know, the organized crime. And I said, this has got to be a different way based on the book that Nick had, Wise Guy. I said, something else. It's like a lot of people I knew and stuff. And I understand it. And I also understood the uh, life spiraling out of control with drugs and that sort of thing. So I said, what if we, um, yeah, I designed the whole picture. Michael Ballhouse was another one who really knew, uh, who really understood the drawings, the movements, and didn't make a big deal of the movements. He had, he had worked with Fassbender in Germany and they moved the camera. They, they didn't need necessarily giant um, pieces of equipment and stuff like that on that particular film and on After Hours too, in Last Temptation. Michael was, uh, uh, he would always look at me and smile and say, I think we can do this. He was never complaining about it. I would complain. He goes, no, 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 no. You know, we're going to do this. But what happened that day, I t Joe didn't want to do the picture because he, he felt he was getting typecast as, as an Italian, you know, wise guy. He didn't want to do the film. So, yeah. So I said, we had lunch. Those days we used to have lunch. Now we don't. No time for lunch. <laughs> getting old. We are old. We got to work. So <laughs> dinner, okay. But even that, fast. So Hey, Joe, he said, you know, I don't view guys all the time and Raging Bull and I was the, I get the Italian American thing. And I said, all right, all right, all right, all right. I said, look, this would be something you can come in and do this part. Da, 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 da. I was trying my best. And he goes, but there is one thing I want to show you. I said, yeah. And he said, but I can't sh show me here in the restaurant. He goes, no, I can't. So we went up to an apartment I was living in and he acted out. Are you talking to, uh, are you, uh, you think I'm funny? There was this guy he knew who was in jail. I think he's dead now, but uh, that happened to Joe. 
you know, Joe comes from the Bronx and it's a whole other uh, world of that kind of life. And uh, that's what happened to him and other things of that nature, I think, uh, I don't know, but he understood it. And when I saw that, I said, well, that's great. I said, we can do that. He said, where, where are you gonna put it? I said, don't, I'll figure a way. I didn't have, I knew it was in the script, but I knew there was one place I could put it, just stop the movie. <laughs> And we were so excited. And so we got into actual rehearsals in a rehearsal hall, of all things, where we went through this dialogue with um, with uh, uh, Bob De Niro and, uh, oh my God, who's our lead? Henry Hill. Uh, yeah. Ray, Ray, Ray. And Lorraine Bracco and the guy who plays Maury, Chuck Lowe. And then, and of course, Joe. Uh, but Joe doesn't like to rehearse. He doesn't like to read that stuff. So, uh in any event, I had him and Ray improvise that and I recorded an audio tape and we did like four or five takes. Then I had all that typed up. Then I reconstructed the scene on paper mm -hmm. and that was it. And I gave it to Joe and Ray. And again, we were shooting on uh, 49th Street at uh, Broadway in a place. And that was another day, I think it was a Friday where people were, uh, we were rushing and we were again on that picture too, went over schedule. And so things were a little, you know, uh, tense, but we were having such a good time yeah, that um, I set up the shots and I realized that there should be in um, medium shots, no close-ups, because as the, the tone and the atmosphere changes, you have to see the people around him change, you know? Mm -hmm. And we started doing the scene. And I remember Joe tried to, um, see, I, I rewrote it from the improvs to build, there were certain levels we had to hit until finally he says, I almost had you there, you know? Um, but Joe started to go off those levels. He started to go off and go off. And I said, no, I had to tell him, I took him aside and I said, Joe, I want this to be the best thing you've ever done. You gotta stick to these lines from the improv, the original improv. And you fool around around it, but you gotta hit these levels. Mm -hmm. So, all right, all right. And he, he got it. He got it. And uh, so for me, it was a very constructed improv. There are other things that happens, uh, you know, uh, one, sometimes an actor becomes a tour de force and they just, he or she just goes, like Ellen Burst in Alice Doesn't Live Here or, you know, Kate Blanchett in, in uh, Aviator. She does some things that just leave it alone. Don't touch it. You know, a lot of that, I believe, for your students is creating an atmosphere. But yet the tension is that you still have to control it. But you can't, I think you can't let them know you're controlling it because you might restrict them. Mm -hmm. This all goes back to one major issue is that you both should be making the same film before you start, you know, hack it out, argue it out. We may find that I've had people over the years uh, uh, audition and work on a project and they looked at me after a few of the, uh, few, a few of the rehearsals and said, I, I'm not right for this. You know, some wonderful people. I said, oh, okay, you're, you're, if you don't feel it that way, don't do it. And, you know, if I can just squeeze in, because this is exactly my next question. And I'm talking about the, how, how do you choose who you work with? For example, you, you've been, you, you've been known to work with the director of photographies repeatedly. You, you said Michael Palhaus, Robert Richardson, Mr. Yeah. Michael Chapman, uh, Chapman, like you said, and how, how could you elaborate a bit on how you choose, for example, a DOP or an editor? Because plenty of our students here are editors and, and, and also, of course, DOPs among others. So if you could just yes, elaborate I mean, a bit. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, I was lucky uh, to be with... Uh, I had, I had a, a boxcar Bertha, which was an exploitation film I did for Roger Corman, shot in 24 days. There were three DPs. First one quit. Second one came on and he was a really uh, interesting guy. He was a stunt man, a uh, famous stunt man photographer. And he was angry at everything, but he taught me a few things and especially about staying on schedule. Because yeah. <laughs> it was my first What's film. Important? That was my first film on a schedule. You know, again, everything was drawn, pictures and you know, he didn't like it. And the fourth guy, I mean, the third guy came on, a man named Wayne Rescher, who had shot Paul Newman's Rachel Rachel out, out, out of New York. And he got everything I wanted with the drawings and on time and everything, but no personality problem. 
he was an older gentleman and he was very happy to be there and work for five or six days and finish the film with me. Um, I found that um, uh, I was very lucky then to find another guy named Kent Wakeford um, and uh, we had a great collaboration with Michael Chapman. Something about uh, Chapman and uh, Ballhouse is that they loved cinema, movies, and I could talk with Chapman and say, you know, the red over there reminds me of, uh, no, that's Piro LeFou. Okay, can we take two, <laughs> can we go, can we do the uh, Vibra Savi track that she does in the record store? <laughs> no, I'm gonna, you're, you're, you're putting it at an angle. The Vibra Savi track is parallel. It's gotta be parallel, okay? There's, and what size lens? Oh, well, let's see, but the wide angle, well, you're gonna, an 18, no, that's too much. So we had an excitement and we also understood, they also, you know, here was the key thing. They wanted to give me what I, what I wanted or what I thought I wanted. That's the key. Um, I've, I've met some great DPs in my time. Um, I've had a, one great DP in Italy explaining to me how a film should be made. He said, this is how you do it. And this was back when I, after I had done Raging Bull and everything, and I, I still wanted to work with them. And I realized, wow, good thing we didn't. Picture had fell apart. And uh, because he's saying that's the way it should be made, I would never be able to work with him on, on uh, uh, the way I want to shoot. Um, this doesn't mean you, you, you know, you hope that the way Bob Richardson or uh, a number of others contributed something visual and something, um, how should I say, uh, something more than what you need. As long as it doesn't get in the way of what you're trying to communicate in the shot. And that's happened a few times where they give you so much that I, I forgot what the hell the shot was about. Mm -hmm. And then where suddenly it's all about getting a crane up. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> so that needs adjusting. You know, uh, another great DP is Roger Deakins. Uh, I worked on a film called Kundun. Uh, mm -hmm. And I learned that Roger at a certain point would go for certain light. I didn't, you see, I'm not, uh, exteriors for me, I don't understand um, necessarily what time of day to shoot certain parts of scenes, you know. But he knows that, and he also he could look at a he could look at a scene interior exterior without it without a light meter and uh, determine the f stop, you know. And, wow. and and so he was. I went at his his pace in terms of because I knew that the the results would be uh, lush and and just absolutely uh, uh, like wonderful. Uh, fresco, you know, um, and so um, uh, Richardson was another case, uh, but the Ballhouse and Chapman were the two who were uh, uh, kind of um, almost like family members, where they understood everything. They just understood everything. I mean, Michael, uh, <laughs> when we did the fight scenes in Raging Bull, he really enjoyed it, except that every now, pretty much every other day, he had to sort of reinvent how to shoot something. So you'd hear the you know, and he'd yell at me, look what we're doing. I said, I know, I know. So, well, wait, I think we've got it. And he would get it. And he would, you know, there's a moment where De Niro um, punches, I think, Sugar Ray, and he goes around the room, goes around the ring, and he goes into slow motion, then he swings yeah. back in. And you have to understand that was not, not only not video assist, but also the f-stop had to be changed, the shutter, and the speed of the camera. So you have three people on the camera as he's moving, and they're doing all these changes, but they did it. They did. So um, this was the kind of challenge that he liked. And he wasn't especially black and white because he had never shot black and white before. And Michael, the first day we did a lot of tests in black and white. He would ask Nestor Elamendros well, how he shot My Night at Mods, all of this sort of thing. And, and interestingly enough, the first day, uh, all the rushes we shot, but they were put in the color bath by mistake in the lab. So they were ruined. So we were really nervous because he wanted to see what that was going to look like. Next day, we had to reshoot it and everything. But in any event, um, ideally, they understand how you see, how you see. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's very important. I've, I've, I've talked with other cameramen, yeah. other directors of photography, great artists, but they do certain, they, I felt they would have um, hindered uh, yeah. what I wanted. Uh, not that it wouldn't be beautiful and great, and everything, but I don't know it. I just don't know it. So why go there? In the case of the editor, I, um, 
I came out of really writing and editing, not necessarily photography, but writing and editing myself. So I was an editor in LA, but not in the union. And I edited Main Streets myself and Boxcar. Uh, couldn't take credit because of the union thing. Um, gave credit in Main Streets to Sid Levin, who was a great guy. Uh, Sid was um, Marty Ritz editor. And uh, he was he did Sounder and he's, he's terrific. Um, but uh, what what happened is then I, I, I needed someone in California at that time. Don't forget, you have this kid coming in off the streets and you have a... Uh, uh, you have, you go into a room and there's professional editors and those men, mainly men, uh, do things their way mm -hmm. and they cut their way and don't bring that art stuff in here. You know, not all of them, but many. And by the way, a lot of them were great. It's just that, again, it was like a DP and it wasn't connecting. And so I found a friend, I met George Lucas, his wife, Marsha Lucas, and uh, she wanted to um, uh, uh become a first uh, uh, major editor. And so um, I said, well, why don't we edit? Alice doesn't live here anymore. And, uh, and uh, she would get, um, she would be the editor of the film. And that became Taxi Driver too. But what happened is that um, she would at least listen and do what I wanted mm -hmm. or, and, and therefore add more. But mm -hmm. primarily uh, didn't have the, the uh, uh, not, it's not even ego, it's, it's about, uh, the system she was not part of that system you know mm -hmm. that's the difference yeah. and very often in that system the older guys would say don't let the director in the editing room well yeah if you're making three films a year at fox from 1949 you don't need it i was like what john ford said in my darling clementine he had a beautiful close-up of i believe it was clementine where uh, i think it was wayne i know it was, it was henry fonda looking in the dust as the stagecoach drives away and he said I, I, that wide shot is beautiful, beautiful. He said, I'd love to go, I'd love to go and do a close up of him, but some son of a bitch will want to use it. <laughs> so that thinking is very different, very different from yeah. making films yourself in a, in a loft or an apartment up in the Upper West Side here. So uh, Marsha stayed with me for um, Alice uh, and uh, uh, Taxi Driver and New York, New York, and then went off to work with her husband, George. Um, she won an Oscar for uh, the work she did on Star Wars. And when I got to do Raging Bull, the only other person I, I, I could trust, really, was an old friend that I met at NYU in a small course that we did, uh, Thelma Schoonmaker. And I called her and asked her, um, she was in Pittsburgh working in, on something. And uh, I hadn't seen her in like nine or 10 years uh, and asked her if she'd be willing to edit a feature and she said, well, you know, I never did a feature. I mean, she worked on films with me, documentaries, even Who's That Knocking, she worked on, but they weren't really, uh, they were made on the weekends. They were not mm -hmm. you know, Hollywood, uh, no matter, even if your film was independent, it was still within the Hollywood system. And um, I said, don't worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll, you know she, she came on and she stayed mainly because, um, first of all, I, I love what she does, but she also, understands the way I think in terms of editing and certain edited sequences. And she's able to do it. If she can't do it, she goes, what the hell do you want here? I said, no, remember that? That's two frames off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she does it. And, and or does it even better. And so um, the key thing here is trust because it come out of a situation where Brian De Palma, myself, a number of people um, in the early 70s, the films are being taken away from us in a way. Um, mm -hmm. Brian De Palma's film, Get to Know Your Rabbit, was taken away by the actor. Uh, uh, George Lucas's THX, they were threatened to take it away. Uh, it didn't happen, but they were threatening him. Um, and a number of other filmmakers, younger filmmakers, new filmmakers, the films are being taken, taken control by the actors. And the editor owes their allegiance, the way Robert Wise did with Orson Welles, to the studio. Mm -hmm not the director. I see. Yeah. And so here, I didn't find that, that um, she would ever do that. And the same with De Niro, you see. Other actors, I love them, I don't know, but I always had a feeling about what's gonna happen in the final analysis when it comes down to the battle, the big battle, the final climactic battle. Uh, will they agree to have the picture taken away from me by the studio? Because that's always the case, it's always, it's always there. 
sometimes people get sick, you know, and yeah. can't continue. Um, so um, the loyalty, trust, and um, a friendship that's lasted over 45 years or so. Uh, we like hanging out and, uh, you know, uh, as I say, uh, she knows how I want to cut something. And she's also open to um, exploring new ways like we did in Silence or Irishman, mm -hmm. you know, not, not pushing back and saying, I think we need this. And I said, let this play, let this play, you know, and she'll go with it. Um, so that's, that's the key. I think it's really everybody, uh, for students have to understand whoever you're collaborating, these are the very, very close collaborators. You have to, you have to agree on what you're doing the story you want to tell and how you want to tell it. I think I need to hijack the conversation right now. I'm getting uh, weird signs from the background. Uh, oh, I, uh, okay. I'm uh, thank you so uh, much. Really, thank you so much. I feel like we could have had this uh, conversation. Well, we could go on. <laughs> on end, um, but unfortunately, you have other obligations. Otherwise, we would have stayed. Yes. Yeah, um, I have to do this. I have to do this movie here. That's, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> You're a busy man. I was asked one last question to add Please. from a press corps. Um, are you familiar with Israeli cinema by any chance? Uh, have you seen Israeli films? Yes, I have. I've seen some. Um, Gitai, of course, I know. I'm, uh, Amos. And uh, Rikles, what's that? Um, Rikles. Yes, yeah, I like his stuff. And there's some other ones that I've seen. Usha Pin and I... It's hard for me to pronounce the word Menashe. There are different things that I I, I find on on um, um, uh, I actually find on the algorithms of uh, having seen uh, certain Israeli films. Uh, the one I forgive me, I forget the title, but of the young man who's supposed to be killed in the war and comes back, outpost, or he's in a uh, uh. his mother thinks he's killed and he arrives. He hasn't been. Buzz, do you remember? Yeah, it's incredible. Now we're all uh, black out. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. They do this great musical number at the end, the outpost. Uh, it was just, I, you know, wild, wild. A, a seven, the, the last movie by uh, Shmulik Maoz. Uh, yeah, hmm. Foxtrot. Fox that's Fox it, Fox. Fox. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah that was it. Suddenly, <laughs> pretty. <laughs> oh, I would love to see more. Can you send me some? Of course. We will, certainly will. We will certainly will. And thank you. I would, I would like to join everybody uh, thanking you for sparing this hour, hour and a half uh, with us. Uh, it was really illuminating hearing your words and uh, sharing your memories, your ideas about filmmaking. It's very important for our students to hear first and then let me extend our invitation to come here and teach a master class whenever time oh, I'd allows. love to. Yeah. And yeah. This will be this will be great for us uh, so whenever you can do that we are you're welcome i would like to thank everybody who took uh, part in this uh, in this event and especially those who made could, made it happen uh, Luis de jesus and lisa purchased from from your office and scott yes. uh, feinstein amos elad and El regev Agnes goldman and uh, ayana segal cohen and our technicians gil sharon and dima fenchenko thank you everyone for joining us and I hope to see you in our next event. And thank you, right. Mr. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you in person. Okay. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah, you Bye. too. <laughs>